hi, I'm Charlie, and this is Ben, you know? Um, but hey, we can go with that. Yeah, there we go. You know, one of the things I was really interested in talking about was I think that we look at the concept of targeting on Facebook um, probably a little bit differently. And so I would love to be able to chat with you here and kind of ask you more about the way you're looking at it and to really get down to the bottom of why you're doing it that way and maybe present some of the way that I'm thinking about it. And at least there can be somebody to be a fly on the wall between two folks that well, I've been teaching for a long time and have quite a bit of experience in the different ways that they think about it. And I think yeah. that is an opportunity that a lot of people don't get. And so why not bring it to them? Sure. The first thing right out of the gate, just, you know, your last video, let's just start there because it's your most recent thing. So most top of mind, let's go with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, how do we target? And you were talking about tra site traffic and engagements and followers and video views. I'll be honest, you know, I don't do much retargeting at all, but I'm curious as to like, one, just how you feel about retargeting in the ecosystem. And then, you know, uh, people can get dive into more about how to do it, but what you find the most value and maybe last point of what, how you define that value when you're doing audiences, when you're running ads. Yeah. So just retargeting in general, we have to say that it's less effective than it used to be. Uh, pre iOS 14.5, we still do a lot of retargeting. I'd say for most clients, there's going to be, you know, a retargeting ad set in a campaign or a retargeting campaign within that. So typically, it's where we're going to see our best results on, say, a cost per purchase, cost per lead basis, depending on on what we're what we're advertising. I know you typically don't do a lot of retargeting. Well, from what I understand, is you're more going to do open targeting and. A lot of people are going to be captured within everyone that's available, right? And they're going to be sort of by default retargeted. I think there's a lot of merit to that. I think where I like to specify some retargeting would be, well, we like to do that with most clients anyway. I feel, I feel there's a little downside to doing so. But I think where it becomes particularly important in it is in ad accounts where you're advertising something where building that relationship with the prospect becomes more and more important. So... Is it as important with, say, a low value e-commerce business? And by low value, I mean the products that you're selling, not necessarily the business itself. Right. Of no. course, of course. Like yeah. something like no, 20p. Not... You know, <laughs> yeah. might... It's not going to be as important in that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we're advertising, you know, a $20,000 service, I think the opportunity there is, and, and sort of the need for it, really, to get multiple exposures of whatever it is that you provide to your prospect is there. And I think that with retargeting, we're able to do that more, more accurately and be more confident that we're going to hit those people again and again. I got you. So with, you know, you call it open, you know, with respect to open targeting and how it's going to be, as you said, kind of doing it by, by anyway, yeah. um, but less focused. Um, is it the lack of focus on those individuals that is really the pain point? So the lack of the ability to control the funnel, that is, that is uh, what you're trying to fix for? Yeah, I think it would be control, not necessarily the funnel, because I'm not the biggest fan of they have to do step A, step B, step C, that sort of thing. But I think when we specifically retarget, we can be more confident we're reaching people, perhaps with ads that don't immediately lead to a purchase or sale. You know, if I think about the typical campaigns that we're running where we're using a lot of open targeting, we'll be running a sales campaign, let's say, and we're looking for those, for those purchases. A lot of the times when we're running ads to retargeting audiences, we might be looking to do something with virtually no expectation that someone's going to take an action there and then. And I feel like if we were to leave that open, it's like, what are we really optimizing for here? We could just end up reaching anyone. Whereas if we're really specific with, okay, we're only going to retarget our email list or people who visited our website in the last 180 days, something like that. And we want to put this demonstration video of how our service is delivered or this customer testimonial in there. Now, we might, depending on the business we're advertising, we might think someone's only going to go for this service when they're ready. They're not going to be interested until perhaps their life circumstances are, are there. You know, I get a good classic example. You know, you run a, an ad campaign for, say, like a divorce lawyer, right? There'll be people watching that content. Maybe they checked out someone's website who, you know, their marriage is a little bit rocky and they're sort of thinking, but they're not going to pull the trigger until, you know, that's what they're actually doing. They are actually sort of separated and they've decided with their partner, okay, this is done. So in those circumstances, if we're retargeting those people, we're not going to be able to generate a lead until their life circumstances are ready. And we want to be able to put stuff in front of them again and again 
that means that when they are ready, that's the only business they want to work with. So that's the logic there. Um, and, and that's quite a, it's quite a specific case. But I think with a lot of, particularly with service-based businesses, that becomes more and more important. No, I get that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's about, I mean, ultimately, I think the concept of retargeting and, and, and narrowing your focus and being, is, is, is the focus, is the, is the priority of being top of mind when yeah. the decision needs to get made and so that when somebody says all right i'm looking for this thing you're the thing that they're like all right i'm not looking for this thing i'm looking for this person or this service or this company to do it for me yeah in a retargeting audience let's say i mean what do you think is a typical conversion rate of a retargeting audience if i have a thousand people in a retargeting audience how many people might buy i mean i think it's going to depend on the there's so many variables there right it's going to depend sure. on the price of the product um you know there's 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 tons that go into that how yeah. warm is that audience right so sure. you know there's warm audiences and then there's warm audiences and someone who visited your website for 30 seconds four months ago is nothing in comparison to someone that watches everything you put out on instagram for example sure sure and, and then different than somebody that added to cart yesterday and all of those yeah. things yeah let's say if i have a retargeting audience where 25 percent of those individuals are interested in what i'm doing then I would also, my point to the unit economics is that retargeting audience is probably going to be more expensive, right? Like, let's say yeah. a we'll broad here, audience is, uh, for the purpose of this conversation, let's call it a 20 pound CPM. Yeah. And a retargeting audience is a, let's say, 40 pound CPM, just to keep it hyperbolic and simple for the yeah. example. It's, in that case, my, my one of my pain points is I'm investing more money at a higher cost per inventory and a higher frequency, creating negative experience for people sort of at scale. So if I know three out of four people don't want to see my advertising and I'm paying more money to reach them, what I've noticed in talking with engineers and product stuff, and I'm curious if you've seen some of a similar thing or how you feel about it, is that one, ultimately our job in Facebook is to help the machine give end users a positive experience, right? Like I'm sure you've heard the term, like the average person swipes the height of the Eiffel Tower on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so my issue isn't so much in trying to control the funnel because I definitely believe in that. I definitely under, understand that you want to be top of mind, not controlling the funnel. Yeah, I, I, and I believe yeah. in how you're thinking about it too. I think we're on the same page. I think my concern is that... I'm investing a, a portion of my budget, 10%, 30%, whatever the business happens to be. It could be 50%, who knows? But I'm investing a considerable portion of my budget, specifically creating a majority of negative experiences for the Facebook user. And in my experience, that tends to raise my cost of advertising, even for my top of funnel efforts. And I'm wondering if, if you've seen the same thing or if you've thought about it that way or if, yes, you have, and you know what, the cost-benefit analysis completely pays off. Yeah, I think I would lean more towards that last point that you made, that I would be okay with annoying a good chunk of the audience if we feel we can drive sales um, from the remainder that are interested. I think... I completely understand what you're saying. I think for me, where I would come down as to whether I would, you know, completely buy into that versus not would be, what are we advertising? Okay. So I think that would make a big difference. So if, for example, we were running a three-day flash sale for a business that has, let's say, large warm audiences, but is relatively new to Facebook and Instagram advertisements. They don't have a lot in their ad account yet, not built up. In that sort of circumstances, I would want to be pretty retargeting heavy in terms of the budget split. We're going to hit the people that have already bought or already interacted. We're going to hit them hard. There's not, I, I don't have enough faith in Meta's targeting systems for them to be able to find those people during that sort of time period. So in that sort of scenario, I'd be very nervous just sort of trusting it, um, that it would find those people or find the people within the warm audiences that are willing to purchase um, exclusively. But, you know, if we were running like a, a more sort of stable campaign that's being run over a long time period, I can completely understand what you mean. Like, why burn out some of your best prospects? Why annoy some of the people that have already shown an interest? That makes complete sense. I think there are circumstances, often with service-based businesses, where we're not 
we, I want to force that they know how we do things because I know that helps with the conversion. I want to force certain things. I want to force that they're going to see some client testimonials because I know that when that business's sales team gets on the phone with them, they're probably more likely to convert. It might help with subsequent metrics. Whereas, yeah, if we're, you know, certain things, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page. Yeah, so what I'm getting here then is really that for you, at least, you'd rather, like you said, force those impressions, force those ads on the people to make sure that they're top of mind. And I guess the way that I view it, just kind of wrap this up, is that if I'm forcing my impressions onto people, knowing that in this case, 75% of the people that I reach have already kind of made a decision to say no, so it's a negative experience, but to your point, the economy of scale might pan out. My concern is less in the people that I'm upsetting, the 750 out of the 1,000 that I'm upsetting, and more in the fact that my cost to reach the other mm. 20, 50, 200 million people is going to go up because I've given the signal to Facebook and my advertiser score and my relationship with them as a business partner that I am invested and creating a negative experience for their users. And okay. my other pain point to that is, I, I think where you have lack of faith in Facebook's ability to find the right individuals that are warm in that audience, I think I look at it more as I have a lot of confidence in their ability to understand who wants to see my type of content. And I have way more confidence in that than I do that my audience is inclusive of those people uh, to, to a fullest extent. And that, you know, somebody might have ad blocking, somebody might be signed up with a different email address, the right person might not have, you know, gone on Instagram, whatever the case is. I, I look at that retargeting audience more as a 99.9% .9 exclusion that raises my cost of advertising across the board. It's a, it's an interesting thought, and I, I can completely understand the logic. And you are going to pay higher CPMs to reach a retargeting audience than you are um, a broader audience. Um, so I completely understand that. And I, I guess my point is my broad audience cost per CPMs goes up because when I'm you're retargeting. Sure, yeah, well, that's likely to happen as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think that... I think that makes sense. And I think there's some logic to following through, the, you know, through what you said. Okay, you do this, it's going to have a negative impact on here. I guess it it all boils down to what you're looking to optimize for. So, for example, I would be completely on board with what you just described if we were advertising content to build an audience. Okay. Like if that was the end objective, okay, um, that was what I'd want to do. Because that user experience is going to be the absolute most important thing. But if, for example, we're advertising something relatively expensive and the primary objective was something like lead quality, which you know would be a, a, a concern that a lot of clients will raise, then by sort of forcing you know, ad impressions of client testimonials, um, how the service is delivered, um, videos that show people who had a nightmare situation just like your potential prospects have, that sort of stuff. By forcing those impressions, it's going to cost more sort of within the ad campaign, but we might see better results on the conversion, particularly if there's like a sales team involved because they've been pre-prepared. So that so wouldn't a... apply to an e-commerce business necessarily. I mean, it could if it was a high value e-commerce product. You know, you might see a higher percentage between add to carts and purchase or something along those lines. But I think that's where I would I would differentiate be between the different type of thing. I'd be less concerned about Facebook doesn't necessarily want me to do it this way and more like, no, I want this person to see this thing before my sales guy gets on the phone because they're going to more like to convert. We're Got it. Be fair, I draw the line on that. No, that makes sense. And so you're really moving to that push towards qualitative, I guess. My final concern about that is just that feels like a depreciating investment and in that ultimately I'm, I'm optimizing down and I, that's just hearing you talk, hearing you explain it. Yeah, yeah. It feels like I'm optimizing down and I'm optimizing. I, I, my cost to bring new people into the funnel goes up over time. Yeah. And my hope is that 
the quality of people I get in my funnel also goes up. But one of my concerns is at some point, we're going to reach an inflection point where the cost of inventory rises while the conversion rate rises, but it means that it ultimately becomes the cost benefit analysis of getting a sales call booked. Yeah. Ultimately gets to be undesirable because in that scenario that you've described, we're basically accepting that our net cost of advertising will more or less increase even at a small rate over time. Um, because if we know that what we're doing is going to raise our broad targeting at some point, do we think that that rise in price is going to be, well, if I do it, it's going to be 25. And if I don't do it, it'll be a 20. Or is it, if I do it, it'll be a 25. And then three, four months later, it might be a 27. Three, four months later, it might be a 30. I'm, again, being hyperbolic for the purpose of this conversation. Yeah, yeah. And that at some point, even if I had a hundred, take that out to the nth degree, even if I had a hundred percent conversion rate, I would have my sales team sitting around not answering phone calls. Like, does that make sense? And that the yeah. cost of inventory and the conversion rate ultimately leads me to a point where it becomes too expensive to book a call. Uh, I mean, versus I'm not, I'm basically, I'm draining the funnel and optimizing it more effectively than I'm filling it up. And that becomes a depreciating asset is, is I guess the way that I'm looking at the situation you've described. Yeah. So I think theoretically that could happen. I've never seen it because I don't think you'd ever reach those levels. So there's a few factors going on. Firstly, your audience is going to, depending on your other marketing efforts, if we're talking about retargeting specifically, that audience is going to refresh itself to some extent. There's going to be in sure. and out. So that, that helps prolong that. And also, I don't think we'd ever say reach a saturation point or get to the point where our retargeting audience was a large enough proportion of the overall target market where it then continues to just see the other cold audience targeting prices go up and up. Like we just never really get there. And if we did, unless it was something really, really specific, I think the business would have generated so many leads and so much business that that would be sort of a, you know, we've milked this one dry kind of kind of effect and, uh, and we need to come up with a whole new offer anyway. So I, I yeah, I understand the logic in theory. I, I would say we've not experienced that. We've, we've okay. not hit that critical mass to get to that point. I got you. Yeah. I, and I, I agree the critical mass there is probably going to be tough. I guess my point is that if we know if we run retargeting, our broad targeting will go up in price. Eventually, we're just having our open targeting go up over time, no matter what. And if our retargeting audience, if our retargeting audience is always 5,000 people, and our cost to fill it rises every couple of weeks, every couple of months, every year. The efficiency within that retargeting to close somebody has to get better and better and better. Or I'm going to basically price myself out of the market. I think that's that's more of the, the point that I, I think I'm trying to get to, the, the way that I'm looking at this. Yeah. So if I give an example business, the way I would sort of think about that, you know, if I think of the businesses where I'm like, okay, we really need the retargeting. It's going to be really important. They're nearly always going to have very high average customer values. Like we will retarget as well with other types of businesses, but where I think the ones that are like, okay, we need this because no one's going to commit to a $30,000 service sure. if they haven't had those exposures. So I think what we typically find with those businesses is that the cost of customer acquisition, actually it the advertising cost as a proportion of what they generate is relatively small. Sure. And they may spend more on a sales team to get the, if I often will, if they pay on commissions or whatever, than it was to generate the equivalent leads that were necessary to generate that sale. So, you know, even if we had what you're describing, and let's say over, you know, the next, I'm trying to give a somewhat realistic time frame. It's even well, over the next if, five we say, years, if we say the CPMs start. year over year are going to rise, continue, to, if, the, yeah. if we're going to assume the statement that I see all the time that, well, cost on advertising just goes up on Facebook every year. Yeah. I don't think we would see a large enough percentage increase for those sorts of businesses where it would be like a deal breaker. Got Whereas it. I, I think a lot of those, you might need to 10x your lead cost in order for them to be like, we can't do this anymore. Okay. Um, and there, you know, that would just, uh, you know, unless there's real shifts in like the overall cost. I Got it. Really, so in these situations, really just 
the margin of unit economics allows such an investment because that's your business model. That is your yes. low cost trigger. Whereas in, for instance, beauty products, you might get uh, yeah. something landed for 78 cents, you sell for $200 and all of your margin instead of on the sales team goes to the advertising. Like, yeah, yeah. there's always some thing that, where you get where you get the bread and butter made. I got it. So it's really for those business models where the cost per acquisition of the attention uh, leaves so much margin that you're less concerned about it because there's something else going on in the business, whether it's in this use case, uh, a sales team or, or uh, sales yeah. calls where you're getting it. I got you. Yeah. Those are the scenarios where I really feel like retargeting is very important. Got now it. we will retarget in other scenarios. We will retarget for e-commerce businesses and things like that. Part of that might be that we just couldn't bring ourselves to not like we'd be unwilling to take that risk on a client account because we know that that retargeting audience is going to deliver results it's in those scenarios that i'd be very interested to test your theory um obviously it's sometimes difficult with client accounts because it's like well we're of gonna course. run this experiment on your account they're like hang on <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Like and then you, the and last three years you know yeah and then you also face the issue of facebook's machine learning algorithm you've invested heavily in teaching it think of it as an employee you've invested heavily in teaching that employee to do a job very well yeah. And now you're getting another employee that doesn't know how to do it nearly to the same level of efficiency. So there's an investment. And in, if we assume the cost rising, this scenario where it potentially could be a depreciating investment, but that's okay because the margin is large enough. The requirement it would take to invest and develop the appreciating asset that goes up in value um, might be, you know, you might not have the clients around long enough or get them to buy into like, let's change everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Makes that's, makes total that's, sense. And, yeah, and that's, that's what I love it because I think what you're talking about is a real agency scenario or when you're doing it for somebody or even marketers doing it for themselves. You know, what is the cost benefit analysis of changing lanes, right? Of, of thinking about things yeah. differently. And you know, that's one of the big things that I see is when I tell people, you know, and I'm interested to hear about you know, top of funnel stuff too, but when I get to people to broad targeting only you know one of the things i see people do all the time it's a big mistake is they just turn off everything they have and they run broad and they're like well right. this is way less efficient and then they say it doesn't work yeah. and the reason i well, two things one like we're talking about training the machine <clears throat> to do the job really well but two i think the way that people measure their results is I find that people do that in a way that is fairly flawed in that I don't know most marketers I talk to don't look at the incremental lift of their advertising. Instead, they're looking at the results by ad or by ad set or by campaign. I, I got into something with one of our friends in the Twitter sphere and YouTubers, and uh, it was interesting he said something along the lines of, I spent a thousand dollars on this ad and it had a row as of X, what should I do? Yeah. <laughs> and my response was, well, what was the impact on your business? And their response was, well, we don't have any way of measuring what this ad's impact is on the rest of our business. And my reply to that is, well, then you don't have any data in order to make that determination. Because your CPA, your ROAS, isn't necessarily incremental sales volume, incremental revenue. Uh, you might have something that's really, really good at a CPA. And I appreciate that you're talking about cost per lead, cost per acquisition as, as, a, as a KPI here. But one of my concerns when people go to broad, and it's interesting when I was at this conference, I had this conversation about five times at a table in like two hours. I was like, literally one person sat down, the next person asked the same question. And I <laughs> sort of like on a carousel said the same thing over and over again, which is great. You know, they said, well, it doesn't work, but my business is doing great if I could only figure out Facebook. And my response to them was, you went broad. Facebook said you made, let's be hyperbolic, no sales, but your revenue keeps going up. What's happening to your search? What's happening to your organic traffic what's happening to your email open rates and and value per email when you're running broad where you're asking facebook to amplify your business instead of deliver you direct results and almost to the person let's say to the man but there's more women actually asking that question than men um which was exciting to to talk to more and more people about this 
Um, but almost every one of them said that going that route ultimately lifted, they noticed the lift in revenue in their business, even though Facebook looked worse. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious with, you know, I've, I've seen more about ad options and retargeting, and I get it too. I'm looking at your YouTube and Instagram stuff. So I'm get, you're getting the things that you're teaching out because we were also trying to get attention. So with that being said, I'm curious about how you feel about targeting options or the funnel or, or more importantly, how you're measuring the results of the work that you're doing instead. Is it just purely on a cost per action basis or are you measuring it against the impact of the entire business? I think that's one of those things that is probably one of the, the harder things that you have to deal with when you have an agency running stuff for clients is that I will actually take quite a different approach for my own marketing than we will for our clients because I will take more of what you described, a longer term approach. What is this doing overall? How are we doing overall? Not necessarily tracking every little thing. And, you know, if I'm running ads for my own services or whatever, I'm not necessarily, okay, I'm trying to track through every single, oh, I ran a retargeting ad and it got me this many new leads. But okay, yeah, but if we just compare this month to when I was running the ads to last month when I wasn't, we're up significantly more, which is exactly what you described. Very hard to do with a lot of clients. Clients just aren't going to, I think actually a lot of clients just won't believe you. They'll sort of think that you're trying to over-exaggerate the results you're delivering. So when we are running for clients, we are going to be more focused on the specific how many leads do we generate? What did they cost? How many sales do we generate? What did they cost? And I would like to take a longer term approach. And some of them are okay with that, but not all. The best case scenario often is that you start off being like, look, we've got you a 30% improvement in um, in your ROAS. And you work with them on that basis for a year, and then they start, start trusting you a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so I think that's a, that's that's a division. I often have this come up with like my, my video editors when I'm sort of creating videos, and they'll often want to... Um, you know, use like snippets of some things that I do marketing my own business in like videos. And I say, oh, well, can we use this? And I'm like, well, the only thing is that's likely to pay off in two to three years time. And I'm not sure that many people are that interested in finding out about stuff that's going to pay off. For me, I'm happy to do that with my own business. But as if I'm like, you know, teaching it or showing clients, uh, not everyone's got that patience. So I completely agree. But yeah, it's just a, a different setup, I think sometimes. So you have to do to keep people happy. I got you. So it's more of a, client education issue. Like if we could get it, uh, more people to appreciate that what we're trying to do is instead of taking credit for a larger piece of the pie, make the pie bigger. Yeah. And if they believe you, great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that, you know, I've seen some people present reporting that makes this fairly straightforward. And I've seen other people that are very much focused and, and and very much insist that what they need to do is spend X at X row as so that they can get more yeah. money. And that's their definition of success. And so um, what I'm hearing phrase a different way. And let me see if you agree is that you might have to say the definition of success is spend X money at X row as because that's the client need, but you as the marketer appreciate that ultimately that's not the biggest version of a goal. That's not really where you would like to go if you could get them to buy in for the whole way. Yes, that is absolutely correct. Yeah, that, that is absolutely correct. I would rather people have that approach. And that's the approach I take with my own business. Given that I operate within an ads industry, the fact that I put so much time and effort into organic content and have done for seven years now, that speaks to my own marketing. I'm going to take a longer term focus. And the first, I don't know, 75, 100 YouTube videos I created did basically nothing, but they're laying the foundations that then build the audience that then produces. So it's like trying to talk a client into that would be very, very difficult, but I can do it myself. So yeah, I mean, we have clients that are absolutely insistent on every single sale being attributed to one platform because they'll be running multiple stuff and they want to know exactly where it comes from. And I often try and have to tell them like, okay, imagine this scenario. Someone sees a Facebook ad, they click on it. Three days later, they remember the name, they Google it. They go in, they're about to purchase. They don't manage it because they're waiting in line. A couple of days later, they see a, a display ad on, on YouTube. They click on that and they come to, you know, and you could just keep going down the line on, on things that they do. And it's like, who gets that sale, right? Like what platform? Well, they probably all had a hand in, in making that thing happen. 
Um, but there are those that just want to, they want it one because they want to be able to take a look at all the various agencies or departments within their company that are doing things and go, you're producing this and you're costing this and you're producing this and you're costing this. But like with any business, any positive profile raising of the company, the brand or the main, you know, let's say it's like a person led company, the personal brand of that person is going to deliver massive returns over time. But yeah, as I said, not many people have, have that approach. Open I got you. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. You know, I, I always tell people the average customer journey is weeks or decades long. You know, you, you didn't that. buy your car because of the salesperson at the car dealership. Yeah. Right. They're, they're basically just the, they're a cashier most more often than not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the problem is every customer journey profile is different, right? You and I might buy the exact same thing, but that touch point of the Facebook ad and the YouTube yeah. ad and the search and the email are all wildly different. So it's effectively impossible to truly model each individual yeah. customer journey to say who gets credit for what. Um, and I hear you on the pain point of trying to get the client to buy into that. I, I, and I think that's a pain point a lot of people have, although I love that for you, it's an appreciation of that's how we should be looking at it. Yeah. Um, although maybe that's not how we can get our clients aren't there yet to appreciate that that's what we're doing. And I think that's a very real world example of you're getting you as a business are getting clients and this is what they're asking for. So you're delivering it, even though you know what they're asking for might not be exactly what they need, yeah. but you're also helping their business in general. And hey, you're, at the end of the day, people are giving you their money to do a job. Your job is to deliver on what they need. And yeah. we can't all be completely blue sky, altruistic with our end and, and goals because, you know, food costs money. Um, <laughs> absolutely. Like, I get that. I guess, very interesting. Yeah, because I, I found that one of the first things that I try to do is explain the concept of incremental lift. And I show people the shape of the curve and the level of impact that any marketing channel has on something else. And one of the reasons that I try to have a very simple ad account is because it means that Facebook, I can get, if I can get the entire ad account, say down to one campaign running at CBO, it becomes very easy for me to say, I've got a 10% margin on my target CPA. I'm allowed to spend 50 to get there. I'm at 45. I know that I could increase my budget by 11%, even if I don't get any other attributed sales to this channel. It don't make any sales across the business, and I'm still at my goal, which means that managing each individual channel becomes incredibly simple. Um, and I find that managing that bigger piece is, is usually a goal. I guess with that in mind, just before we head out, I, you know, I always teach people that what I, my optimal Facebook ad account setup is basically a single campaign with an ad set targeting broad with my winning post IDs and one or two dynamic creatives. Uh, putting into there to give Facebook better quality options to for me as an advertiser to provide content that meets their business needs of attracting attention so that ultimately I'm improving my CPMs over time. And Facebook effectively gives me also something we didn't talk about, but I'm getting the second ad in the feed, not the ad that shows up 15 minutes into a doom scroll because I'm a higher quality advertiser. Not only is my inventory cheaper, but my quality is better. So with that being said, do you feel like there is an optimal Facebook ad account setup or someplace you're trying to get most of your clients to, or is it very specific on the client? It's going to be dependent on what the client is offering, I feel. Um, I would say that most of our client accounts are going to follow a very simple structure that's pretty similar to what you described. It's going to normally have a little bit more going on targeting wise, but I would say our most the cold audience targeting option that is most likely to produce the best results for us is going to be broad targeting. So like, I'm by no means against broad targeting. We use it all the time. Um, but I don't think it's the right tool for every business to have that sort of setup. I do believe in simpler account structures. You know, I first started advertising on Facebook at the end of 2013 and sort of 2014, 2015, it was all about the nine step. They oh yeah, a, yeah a, me too. video B, video C, video, oh, yeah. you know. And I, I was always a bit skeptical of that. And that's certainly not something that we would set up, you know, um, anymore. So we would have a simpler structure. I do think that one of the big advantages of simpler structures beyond it, not it's not a bad setup at all to go with like what you described. I think in some circumstances, you're going to see better results with, with something different. But I think one of the things that that does do is it does really focus the mind, right? It focuses the mind on the parts that are going to be more important to your success on the platform, which is going to be what you're offering, 
and and the ads themselves you know the parts that people actually see but there are other businesses where i think i would i would you know to be you know you mentioned fifa and i think for me that would be a good analogy and i would think about it as like depending on which team you're using let's say you're trying to win a, a tournament different teams have different strengths and therefore you're going to want to play in a slightly different style depending on right we've got really fast wingers or if we've got you know guy up front that can score you so there's all sorts of stuff like that so i would say different businesses need different sales for like different sales funnel structures and then that informs the ad account so like we said with the really high-end service providers i'm going to force some impressions on certain stuff because if we're advertising you know a home remodeling business and their average customer value is a quarter of a million dollars we don't care if the cost per lead doubles or triples we want that quality so sure we'll, in that use case you're smashing retargeting aggressively because the margin yeah. is allowing yeah. you to do it exactly that exactly that yeah whereas with other businesses you know if we're selling 20 dollars e-commerce products no we're not gonna we're not gonna we're not gonna do that at all one thing that you said here i just would love to close out on is saying that broad targeting might not always be the way at the int at the at the uh, for the if interest of of uh top of funnel and filling the funnel and and and, and uh prospecting um so i'm curious for you what those other options might look like so we'll still use the range of cold audience targeting that you know people have used for years and we've used for years we will still occasionally use interest based targeting and we will still use lookalikes um often the way we will structure a campaign when we first start working with a client particularly if it's a relatively new newish ad account let's say we almost never work with someone who's not run any ads before they've got proof of concept which is good um is we might create you know multiple targeting options and run them simultaneously run a broad targeting option an interest or two lookalikes and we will will often go with the ones that we see produce the best results. Now we will retest because we know as a, as an account matures, we're likely to see better results with the the broader options. But but we will often test like that, and we still do see some accounts perform better not with a broad targeting option, and that's measured on a, a pretty short term cost per conversion basis usually. Um, that it, it's definitely shifting over time. Like we wouldn't use broad hardly at all. I don't know four or five years ago, and it's definitely going more and more that way. Like more and more often we see that be the best performing targeting option, but not always, not yet. Gotcha. Yeah. I think I was in the biz about five years and then I uh, was part of the disruptor group and power five came out and I was like, I didn't trust broad and it took me about six, nine months to like make the switch in I don't know, yeah. 2018, 2019, something like that. So yeah. I totally hear you, especially that timeline that, that sounds very familiar. Um, I guess my I'll, I'll finish with with this and just kind of curious about you your question on and then we can wrap up is on the on the efforts of interest groups and lookalikes for me i've found that my confidence in the in facebook's data and what it's a, what it's labeled to leverage might not be the best um <laughs> and i think everybody can kind of feel that way so yeah. With, the, with respect to an interest group, you know, I know that the interest group team at Facebook basically hasn't, there hasn't been an engineer there in, in a long time. So it's a software that's kind of set up. And I know that it's not 100% tracking to this person actually is defined well as an interest group and not. And talking about something doesn't necessarily imply positive, positive or negative sentiment or intent. Um, and so for me, that's always been a, if two, if one third of this audience is here by mistake and half the people in this audience feel negatively about something, and then half the people that feel positively might have buying intent, that's, I've gotten it down to maybe one sixth, one quarter of that audience is, is actionable for me. And I know that I'm paying extra to reach them because you were in Facebook back in the day when they showed you how much each one of those additional audiences, so the data logics is going to add a dollar this yeah. interest group is 28 cents and they've hid that I, I don't feel like the kids that's got in a 2018 that are new, the new you know agency run owners because they got really good when it was a bull market uh understand yeah. all of that um but then also when it comes to a lookalike like i've turned to view a one percent lookalike as effectively a 99 percent exclusion <laughs> yeah. and i'm doing that basically saying facebook here's data i don't necessarily trust your data so I'm going to give you data of a thousand, maybe 10,000 people or more. 
I don't necessarily trust your ability, your, how you view this information, but please use it. And of that 10,000 email addresses I upload, maybe it actually matches 7,000 or 6,000 because some don't match up and all of that stuff. To then extrapolate out a 98% exclusion for my audience, that costs me extra. That depreciates in value. I guess that's my pain point. So I'm curious, one, if you're thinking about it that way, or two, if you do, and honestly, just the way that you've seen the results, maybe from what you're saying is initially I get better results, but over time I move away from it. Is that sort of what you're saying? That does happen. Yeah. So I think, I think again, what you've, what you've said in theory is correct. But when we launch new campaigns, we still do see, you know, let's say over the first 14 days, we still do see better results sometimes with lookalike audiences or interests um, or other detailed targeting options as opposed to going broad. The percentage of the time where we see it during those two weeks, the percentage of the time where we see broad not being the best option during those two weeks is decreasing. So like it is becoming more likely that it's going to be the best option from day one. And I think that's going to continue to happen. We're going to see it go more and more that way. Um, but we still see it. And while, whilst we still continue to see that, we're going to sort of be led by the data within that client's account and go that way. But yeah, we will retest because we know that as that account matures, as we get more conversions registered in it, we are more likely to move towards broad options. That is, and it, it, there's rarely going to be an account. Like, let's say we're, you know, we're not high-end service advertiser here. We're advertising a lower-end service, a digital business, an e-commerce business, something like that. Once that account has generated, let's say, thousands of conversions, we're almost certainly going to be broad targeting at that point. What I love about that is, there is the blue sky perfect architecture from day one. And then the practical application of how we start and then build a bridge to get to where we might want to go. And it seems like you and I ultimately have the same end goal. Just maybe how we get there is like yeah. you said on FIFA, uh, maybe a slightly different setup, which I think is great. It, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's really great information. Cause at the end of the day, I think people don't often get to see us talk about the entire journey. And yeah. if it takes two weeks to get that account to set up, and also if I know that I'm running lookalikes and interest groups against Broad, Broad is going to have all the low-hanging fruit stolen by those other audiences. But as I deprecate more and more of those, Broad gets smarter and smarter, and eventually I just transition to completely that, um, which sounds like- and we're, I, Yeah, and we're trying to manage that client relationship. We do not want, particularly when we start working with a client and they've um, run campaigns before, we know it's important to get them something early doors because if we come in and we say look your results are going to get worse they're going to be better in three months time or whatever time frame it is that's not normally something that they'll that they'll tolerate so we're trying yeah. to manage that client relationship and if we can get those that improvement in results over the next two to four weeks when we first start then then we'll take that because i think that helps set everyone up a little bit better emotionally within yeah. the process I love that. You know, it's a great structure and that communication, I think, is very key in setting those expectations, giving you like maybe a 90 day window for everything. Um, yeah. Well, Ben, I know we're a little bit over here and, and I do yeah. appreciate your time. I'll, I'll let you go. I just want to say thanks a lot. And and I mean, hey, look, if you have anything to, that you want to tell people where you're at, I've been following you. I've been noticing you for a long time. I've been in the space for nearly a decade. You've been in the space for nearly a decade, I guess, actually over a decade for both of us now, which is terrifying. Uh... Uh, I think I was late. I was late 2013, so I'm not gotcha, quite there. Gotcha. Nearly. Yeah, I think <laughs> we're coming up on that 10 year mark. I don't know what the 10 yeah, year anniversary yeah, yeah. is. But I need to get a plaque that says I survived. <laughs> I'll be there uh, in like November, I think, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. I think for me, it was like October 2012, I think is more or less when I got yeah. in. But yeah, all that fun stuff. But just in an interest of making sure that we get to, if people did like this and did want to reach you, just quick yeah. plugs or anything else. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks a lot. I mean, you know, very good to chat. You know, it's good. We finally saw we were trying to find a date, and we managed to get some fit in, which is interesting. And I'm always happy to, you know, have like thoughts questioned or you know theories on can we do things better this way? And like you know, we've both been in this long enough to know that things have changed a ton. So you you can't just be stuck in like you have you have to be willing to update and change things. Otherwise, you, you know, if we were all still running the same campaigns we were running like seven, eight years ago, they would not work. That's for sure. Yeah. They would not no, we work. have a conversion pixel now. Like you couldn't yeah, run what yeah. you were running nine yeah. years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, when the very first, you know, you're like, well, we run a page likes campaign and we build that up and then you, oh. you, get, you get organic reach and yeah, things have changed a lot since those yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, trauma so, from yeah, those old so, days. 
Yes, yeah. So, I mean, if people want to find my stuff, if they want to know more about, you know, what I think on Facebook, Instagram ads, then my YouTube channel is the best place. And then from yeah. there, I mentioned like website and all sorts. From, from yeah, there. I love it. And it's just Ben Heath, right? Type yeah. it in. It's hard to miss. Simple yeah. name. <laughs> it is the way you think it'd be spelled. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's all easy. <laughs> it's all easy. So thank yeah. you very much, man. I, I really do appreciate it. And um, I'll talk to you later. If that yeah, works for great. you. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Thanks, man. See ya.